We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, and wherever you find your podcasts. Does the following sound familiar? You have a big presentation to do for work, so you know you need to do lots of research to make it a success. But you keep on putting it off until tomorrow, or you go out for one drink and it becomes many the night before. Self-sabotage, when you get in your own way on a frequent basis, is a really common problem, but one that is really poorly understood. The good news is there are simple tools to break out of it. My witness on The Meaningful Life today is Tice Gibson, who has an MSc in transpersonal psychology. She's the author of the book Attachment Theory, A Guide to Strengthening the Relationships in Your Life, and is the founder of the Personal Development School. Before we dive into self-sabotage, I'd like to get to know you better. So what in your upbringing prepared you to do this work? I think in a really big way... I grew up in a family household that was extremely chaotic. My parents went through like a 17 year plus divorce that just never really ended and is still in some ways ongoing today, interestingly enough. And I think I grew up, you know, as a very sensitive child wondering why does it have to be like this? You know, why can't we have peace or harmony or why do people who love each other have to end up sort of as mortal enemies? And from a very, very young age, I was deeply interested in people as a result, very interested in psychology and human behavior, and went through my own journey of sort of, as a teenager, after internalizing that for for years and years, went through my own personal struggles and really found a lot of solace, a lot of understanding through understanding the subconscious mind and through understanding my own patterns of human behavior and how to shift what it is no longer serving me. So did you end up being your parents' therapist when you were a child or the (laughs) go-between or you just were in your room with the door locked? I was absolutely the parents' therapist. I was the go-between in a very big way. And of course, you know, that it's parentification, right? And there's downsides to that. And I think I had to grow up fast as a result, but there was also a big silver lining there for me. You know, I think some of the, the benefits were that I learned about people a lot and I knew how to operate outside of my comfort zone in a lot of ways because I was good at figuring things out. And, you know, I I actually, as hard as that was in some ways, I'm also grateful for that experience. So we're going to be talking mainly about self-sabotage today. And I've got a quote from you that I think is a really nice and useful quote. So I'm going to quote you and then perhaps we can break down the quote. Self-sabotage is a subconscious strategy to get needs met that our conscious mind is not aware of. I'll repeat that because it's quite a complex idea. Self-sabotage is a subconscious strategy to get needs met that our conscious mind is not aware of. Absolutely. So I always say this, you know, there's no such thing as self-sabotage in the traditional form that we think. It's not our conscious mind waking up one morning and saying, today I'm going to sabotage my life and then choosing that. What we experience as self-sabotage is actually our conscious mind intending something that our subconscious mind is in resistance against due to its pre-existing conditioning. So if you imagine that our conscious mind, if anybody's ever seen that Freud diagram of the iceberg, our conscious mind is roughly responsible for three to 5% of all of our beliefs, our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions or, or behaviors. Whilst our subconscious and unconscious collectively are responsible for 95 to 97%. Wow. And so what that means is that our conscious mind may intend something. And our conscious mind is really our logical thinking self, our rational self that can analyze and take in information. Whilst our subconscious mind is our pattern self, our habituated self, where all of our conditioning lies. So our conscious mind may decide something like, I want to you know, build a second stream of income or save my money better. But if our subconscious patterning or conditioning says, no, we love to spend money instead on social events or fun things, 
then what we're going to experience is this form of cognitive dissonance between our conscious and subconscious mind. Conscious mind rationally analyzes something, says I need to save more money, and intends that whilst our subconscious pulls us back into our pre-existing patterns. Now, our patterns are largely based on our belief systems and our system of needs, our hierarchy of needs. For example, somebody may value or need love and connection more while somebody else may value or need growth more or security more. So there's a a pre-existing hierarchy there combined with our belief systems that it's really determining our behavior. And when our conscious intends something and our subconscious has different motives, that's what we experience as self-sabotage. And it can be a very difficult experience when we're going through it. So are you having a difference between the subconscious and the unconscious? Yes. So one of the major differences you'll actually see between the sub and unconscious, although most people tend to use them interchangeably, is that our subconscious is the part of our mind where we can actually retrieve information from. Whilst from our unconscious, it's much more difficult. So as an example, you may not, you may have this aversion to peanut butter and you may not really know why. And you may have no recollection consciously that you can even retrieve, but perhaps when you were two years old, you had a five-year-old older brother who, you know, said, ha it'll be funny if we eat the whole jar of peanut butter and you ate the whole jar of peanut butter and you got sick. Whereas your subconscious, an example would be, I may feel, you know, a sense of insecurity at some point. And maybe this is when I'm going to meet somebody that I haven't met before. And I may be able to say, you know, why is this familiar to me? What, what experience have I had in a situation like this before? And realize, oh my goodness, when I met somebody in a similar situation 12 years ago, or when I was eight years old or whenever it might be, you know, we can look back at different points and actually retrieve that information and go, oh yeah, I felt like this in that past circumstance. That's what's showing up for me. So I try to work very diligently with the subconscious mind of myself or other people, because we can actually retrieve information from there, understand our conditioning and why it is the way it is, and then actually work to recondition what's not serving us. I think I'm going to, I know the answer to this question, but what is stronger, the subconscious or the conscious? (laughs) The subconscious is much stronger. (laughs) Well, I guess technically it depends which way you look at strength. So, you know, what's really interesting is your conscious mind cannot outwill or overpower your subconscious. So I think that's a really important fact. Yeah, I think let's say that again so that yes. people really get it. Yeah, so your conscious mind cannot outwill or overpower your subconscious mind. So we can intend, and, and everybody's had this experience when somebody said, I'm going to quit eating chocolate for New Year's. And then three days later, they're back eating chocolate. Or somebody says, I'm going to start exercising every day and going to the gym. And then maybe they do it for a couple days in a row and it drops off. Or somebody says, I'm going to stop drinking so much, or I'm going to stop you know, whatever negative habits or unhealthy habits we have. And yet we find ourselves back in those same types of experiences over and over. It's all a form of of our conscious against our subconscious mind that can't be outwilled. But there is one hidden strength to the conscious mind, which gives it this extra sort of superpower, which is that our conscious mind, our logical, rational, analytical self can understand and learn about how the subconscious functions and then leverage that understanding to reprogram or rewire the subconscious mind. And so technically that gives the conscious the ability to change the subconscious, not in the way that we're traditionally thinking about just deciding something and going with it, but there is a hidden strength in there where the conscious eventually can trump the subconscious mind with knowledge, understanding, and application of key principles and tools that that we can always dive into. So and now we're sort of aware of what the subconscious is. Let's start looking at how you work with the uh, unconscious. So one of the things you do is you get people to try and understand their beliefs. So for example, if you have a belief that I'm not enough, that's going to really impact the way that you approach your partner and everything else, isn't it? Absolutely. And and you can see so many of these. So we tend to have specific core beliefs. They show up as our biggest fears and wounds in all relationships, but most importantly in the relationship to ourselves. And these wounds range from things like I will be abandoned or I'll be not good enough or I'll be unloved or unworthy or disliked 
or I'll be trapped or betrayed or helpless or powerless. Then there are these big fears. I'll be disrespected. That person disrespects me. It's these big fears and triggers that we'll go back to. And the reason that they come up and they're so painful and difficult is because the subconscious mind stores everything. So as an analogy, what's really happening when we get triggered is let's say as a child, somebody grew up in a household where there was a lot of criticism from their parents. Maybe the parents meant very well. They were just trying to prepare the child for the world, but the child always heard, oh, you, you got an A minus. Why didn't you get an A plus? Oh, that's not good enough. You didn't score a goal. You didn't do that. Well, the repetition and emotion of that experience is actually what fires and wires neural pathways, which essentially become our conditioned subconscious patterns. So we get fired and wired this feeling of I'm never good enough. And eventually over time, the repetition and emotion of that feeling forms a neural network and it actually becomes a part of our subconscious identity. It's part of how we view ourselves because it's been patterned into us. And then what takes place next is that as a result of that patterning, we may five years later have, you know, in the workplace, somebody say something to us where they're just trying to give us some feedback, but it sounds like they're telling us we're not good enough. And now what, how a trigger works is your conscious mind refers back to its subconscious and says, well, what pre-existing experiences do we have of this? And it's almost like it opens a filing cabinet. And because there's so many stored experiences, because the subconscious literally stores everything, consolidates memories a little bit over time, but stores everything. Our conscious refers to our subconscious and it, it, your subconscious floods out all the times, the emotion connected to all the times we felt not good enough in the past. And so now when somebody's triggered, they're experiencing the moment itself combined with all of the stored associations and emotions of times that somebody felt like that in pre-existing experiences, which is part of why triggers make us seem irrational. We're like, wait, why are we reacting so much to something so small Well, it's usually because there's actually a much bigger, greater history. And I'm curious what you think about that. Well, I was just going to say that when you get a very strong reaction and, you know, later you can step back and say, you know, why was I, and I think the word triggered is a very useful one. Why was I so triggered? You know, why did somebody give me some sort of mild criticism and I reacted as if they'd just told me that I was going to have to leave the company, so to speak? Because that tells us that there's something there that we're not so conscious of and we need to get underneath and understand what the beliefs are. So how do you get under the beliefs? So there are so many amazing tools for how to actually rewire these beliefs. So the the first step is to really discover what our beliefs are. And then we can go into a three-step tool called auto-suggestion that I'm happy to explain. And that's one of many tools, but it's a really good sort of beginner tool. So the first step to discovering what our big wounds and triggers are is to think of a time where you were triggered and really pick a single instance in time and then ask yourself, okay, in that moment, okay, let's pretend it was, you know, somebody not calling you back when they said that they would. In that moment, if you were really triggered, especially because we can look at how for one person, that's not a triggering event. And for another person, it's a super triggering event. So it tells you clearly it's not about the objective experience. It's about about our subjective interpretation, which is actually based on these pre-existing subconscious programs. So we look at that, that moment we were triggered and we say in that moment, when I didn't get the call back or when I, you know, my boss gave me criticism or feedback, you know, whatever that moment is for anybody listening in that moment. What did I make that situation mean about myself or what was I afraid would happen? And we can keep rotating those questions. And eventually when we ask ourselves two or three times, we'll get to this big core pain. Like, whoa, that actually really frightens me. That really hurts me. So for example, somebody may say, okay, in the moment that that person didn't call me back, what did I make it mean? Well, maybe they didn't like me. Okay. And if they didn't like me, what does that mean? Or why is that bad? oh, well then maybe I'm going to be abandoned by that person. And what does that mean? Or why is that bad? Well, maybe I'm going to be alone forever. And underneath there, we'll start to uncover these big core fears that we carry. And interestingly enough, when we then reflect back on our past experiences, were there times where I was scared of being alone as a child or in my upbringing? We'll usually see that there's a really long thread of times that we felt that way repeatedly, which was part of what caused that conditioning. So that's really the first step. Look at one trigger at a time. Even in the moment we are triggered, we can say, what am I making the situation mean about me? And we'll hear those things 
I'm disrespected, I'm powerless, I'm helpless, I'm abandoned, I'm trapped, I'm unworthy, these types of of big core beliefs. So that's step one. Then the really great news is that we do not have to live with those things for the rest of our lives. We can actually rewire them. We're not born with these ideas or concepts. They got conditioned into us and we can work to recondition them. So there's a great tool called auto-suggestion and it's a form of belief reprogramming. And it's really about leveraging the science of neuroplasticity to rewire these pre-existing ideas. So in this particular case, after we found that belief, step one is to now find its opposite. So just as an example for simplicity's sake, let's say it's I'm not good enough. The opposite would be I am good enough. It's a very easy step one. You can look at antonyms online if you ever need to. And that's step one. Step two is we have to understand that the conscious mind speaks language whilst the subconscious mind speaks in emotions and images. That's really important. Yes. And so I'm not sure your thoughts on affirmations, but I'm not a big fan of affirmations for that reason, because they only speak to the conscious level of mind. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm sometimes trying to program in sort of images for some of my clients. So if, you know, I've signed out if they've got any king or queen energy or whether they're always being a courtier, and you can sort of imagine how a king or a queen would respond because if somebody criticizes them, as long as they're a wise queen rather than like the queen of hearts who says off with their heads, who's a tyrant, they're going to listen to what the other person says. But, you know, their fundamental beliefs are going to be so strong and powerful that they're not going to be overwhelmed by them. So sometimes having those sort of images of, you know, I can be the queen in this situation or I can be the king rather than the courtier or the servant can actually give them a whole different way of acting. That's super interesting. I really like that because you're leveraging the power of imagery. So that's really what step two kind of comes down to. So our step one is you find the limiting belief and its opposite. Step two is another way that I like to do it is, is we leverage emotion and imagery together. And what's so interesting is that all memory is a container for emotions and images. So if I were to say to you, tell me your favorite childhood memory, and you started recounting a story, you would probably smile or laugh. Or we've all seen people tell an old story from maybe their fun times back in high school, and they have a laugh and they giggle as they're telling the story. And so what you have is all memories are literally, you would feel the emotion connected to those memories, and you would see the images. If your favorite childhood memory was you playing on the playground, you would see the images of the slide in the playground. So what we need in step two is we need 10 memories to support the new idea in step one. So I'm not good enough. I am good enough. 10 times, 10 memories, I actually felt good enough. Now they can be teeny tiny. They just have to elicit an emotional response. That may look like for somebody saying, hey, I showed up really well as a friend yesterday, or I showed up really well as a parent yesterday when my child was crying and really needed me to be present or I showed up really well as a spouse, or at work yesterday, I took a leap of faith and did something out of my comfort zone. They can be small things, but what we're getting is when we recount a a recent memory or an old memory, we see the images, we feel the emotion, and when we do 10 of them, we're leveraging repetition. So now we're firing and wiring memories or evidence of, of the new idea. I am good enough or I am worthy or worthy of connection or safety or, you know, to oppose whatever the core wound is. Now, step three is we record this into our phone or somewhere we can listen back to it. And we listen back to it for 21 days. Ideally, we listen back to it first thing in the morning or last thing before bed, because our brain produces more alpha brain waves during that time, which makes us more suggestible. Or, you know, in other words, makes us more open to being reconditioned. And so basically, if we do this 21 days of listening back to these pieces of evidence for how we are good enough, research into neuroplasticity shows it takes 21 days to develop neural pathways that are strong enough now that they're unlikely to leave. And you work on the shadow as well. So tell us how you work on that. The shadow. (laughs) The shadow is a big concept. Um, So I love shadow work. Shadow work was originally coined by Carl Jung. And the definition of, of his about the shadow was the shadow is the part of ourselves that we try to deny or hide. Now, the shadow, essentially, when we look at unpacking the shadow as a whole, 
It's generally traits that we get triggered by in other people because they are repressed within ourselves. So for example, the place that I often encourage people to do shadow work from is the moment they have a charged judgment about another person. So I don't mean like, oh, I'm hurt or I'm sad or, you know, I feel irritated by the situation. No, no, no. When you're like, that person is this, (laughs) they are a jerk. She's too perfect or (laughs) she's really critical. Exactly, exactly. And exactly those moments that we're labeling somebody a specific trait. Now, what's really interesting is we only take things personally that are personal to us. So I give people an exercise when they have a trigger judgment towards somebody else. And it's almost like we get a 360 degree view of our own subconscious hidden patterns when we practice this. I I tell everybody, you know, step one, let's look at a time that we were triggered. We had a trigger judgment. And let's say we'll use that wonderful example you just gave. That person is so critical. Like I'm, I'm sick and tired of, you know, for a lot of people, this is their parent or their child or their spouse, you know, those people close to us. So step one, what is the trait that you are judging in that person? Step two, usually what we think to be hidden or not a part of ourselves actually just exists in a hidden form. So in step two, we have A, B, and C, we look This A, B, and C will give us a 360 degree view to see if it's ours. And we look first at the relationship to self. Usually when we're really triggered by other people being critical, it's also because we're our own worst critic. And so the moment somebody else is critical to us, it's like the straw that broke the camel's back. We're like, oh my gosh, I've had enough criticism. I can't take anymore. Or it seems to reinforce all of these pre-existing ideas we have about ourselves being not good enough or not doing a good job. So when somebody's critical, we're like, oh no, my worst fears are true. And that's why it hurts. So A, we look at relationship to self. B, a lot of the times our shadow exists in reactivity, which is hilarious. It's super interesting. Well, what do we do? We're like, that person's so critical. What an awful person. They're this, they're that. And what are we doing? We're just being reactively critical to them. (laughs) So we are being what we are judging back to the person we're judging it in. And so I encourage people to look for their shadow there. And then number three, I encourage people to look at, is there a place that we are critical to someone else in our lives and we're not realizing it? And the first time I ever did shadow work and was really practicing it myself, I really came up with like these three points to look. And what I found is that I was really triggered at the time by somebody being dismissive. I worked in an office space with one other person and he was very dismissive And I realized I would judge it in him. And I would be like, oh, he's a very dismissive person. And so I looked one day and I looked at, okay, well, this triggers me. I'm making a judgment at him. So where am I dismissive to myself? And I realized, oh my goodness, I'm constantly dismissing myself because I'm people pleasing far far too often. And so no wonder he triggers me. He's mirroring that back to me. He's showing me my shadow. Number two, where am I being reactively dismissive to him? And what did I find? I would do that all the time. You know, it was something I had to work on, but he would be dismissive to me. I'd be like, good morning. How are you? He'd be like, I'm fine. And I I would go, oh, fine. He didn't ask me how I'm doing. I'm not going to ask him anything back. (laughs) I'm not going to talk to him either. And so I had that reactive dismissiveness. And then I looked, and at the time, this is about 12 years ago, I was trying to work on the relationship with my father. We had had a tough relationship growing up and I looked and I realized, oh my goodness, I can be dismissive to my father the way that he's dismissive to me. And it it was really eye-opening that, wow, here I am working on this relationship and actually I'm probably making my own father feel the way that this person is making me feel. So I love shadow work because it gives us this 360 degree view into ourselves. And I'm curious if you see any of those and in things that you have ever been triggered around. Well, I was just thinking how useful it is to go all the way back to your parents and your childhood with these things, because that's the great gift of people at work. We're we're close enough to them to to get the reactions, but we can also have a bit of clarity with them as well. Yeah, absolutely. So it's always worth going that extra level underneath. You know, am I being dismissive at work? But who was dismissive to me when I was a child? And am I being dismissive today? Because It's really easy to forget that our parents are not the same people that brought us up. You know, they're 20 years older now or maybe 30 years older. And so 
you know, they're different people, but we can still be treating them in the same old way. Absolutely. I love that. I think that's really beautiful. So are the people who are particularly likely to self-sabotage? To be perfectly honest, I find that it tends to be correlated with people who have a little bit more trauma. So the more trauma we have, whenever we go through painful experiences, we can think of trauma as not having to be like extreme trauma, like wartime trauma. We can think of trauma as being something that basically we can't properly make sense of, feels uncomfortable, and our nervous system essentially reorganizes itself around it because it's a painful experience and we store it as being painful. So for example, the brain is wired to hang on to negative things more than positive. You know, if if you see a bear out in the forest and you run away and you escape, you don't think back a few hours later at, at how pretty that little flower was on the ground next to the bear. You think of, oh my goodness, the huge bear and its claws and its teeth, right? So our, our subconscious is, is wired to hang on to negative more than positive as a protective mechanism and to notice those things. And so the more painful experiences we have, the more negative beliefs we tend to store about ourselves. You know, I am unsafe or I am not good enough for these things we were talking about earlier. And the more negative beliefs we have, the more likely we are to experience cognitive dissonance, the more likely we are to intend something, but we have all of this programming holding us back from actually being able to access our full potential. I mean, I'm thinking about it myself. I think probably we're all likely to self-sabotage. Oh, everybody (laughs) self-sabotages, but you can imagine it is going along a continuum, right? So some people will self-sabotage their goals, their dreams, not even be able to get to like the job or the career they want. Whereas other people may find themselves self-sabotaging around their New Year's resolutions or their smaller goals. And I'm curious to hear where you've noticed self-sabotage and what you did to overcome it. Well, I don't know how well I'm doing. I tend to work too hard and I always say, well, I'm going to work less. And I never quite managed to get round to working less. <laughs> I understand that one. <laughs> and can I ask you a, a personal question? Yeah, if, you, if you were to stop working so much, what, what would you make that mean? Or what are you afraid would happen? Well, I would be afraid that I'd be wasting my time. I suppose that, you know, just sitting there reading a book sort of kind of thing is a bit of a waste of time. Although, (laughs) you know, I do give it to myself as a reward sometimes. And if you were to be wasting your time, what do you make that mean or why is that bad? Well, I think I've only got a limited amount of time here on this planet. And I think the older you get, the more conscious you are of that. So you want to make the moment really work. You know, you've come here for a purpose to this earth, so you might as well do it rather than, you know, sit there and eat pralines. <laughs> I absolutely agree with that in, in terms of the meaning of our time and how sacred it is. But it's interesting if we self-sabotage, it sort of discusses that there's our conscious mind says, no, no, it's in our best interest to work less. Our logical, rational self is like, hey, you know, it may be good to pause sometimes or be more present or or things of that nature. And yet our subconscious seems to go back into these old patterns. And so um, yeah. is there a part of you that maybe it comes up where you say, oh, well, maybe I'm not doing enough and it's sort of related to not enough. Is that a possibility for you? Mm, I think it's a case of not being seen probably. Ah. And I think that's possibly it. And that somehow if I don't work hard, I will somehow disappear. Wow. I love that. You know that that's a core wound in cognitive behavioral therapy, Mm. unseen. I am unseen or unheard. Wow. Well, I'm not unseen and unheard, but I I have a a podcast and I've written many books, but (laughs) I'm working hard to make certain that I'm not. Absolutely. which, Which seems a little bit stupid, but there you are. You asked. (laughs) I think that's a beautiful share. And I think that it touches on sometimes the beauty of Wounds, I know that's a crazy concept for people, probably not for yourself, but I think pain is a beautiful teacher. And I think that sometimes pain brings us beautiful lessons. And it almost sounds like it's a double-edged sword. You know, there's part of maybe this fear of being unseen that pushes you to keep working. But one of the silver linings or beautiful parts of that is that you've created beautiful work in the world. You know, you're creating, you have a podcast, you've written multiple books. And so it seems to come full circle in a sense. So let's look at some of the sabotage techniques. So if this isn't actually speaking to people, I think they will recognize some of these behaviors. So I'm going to go through, I've got six of them, 
and I'm going to throw them forward and perhaps you can uh, tell us a bit about them and how they fit in with this. Procrastination. Procrastination is when our conscious mind intends to do work and our subconscious mind is not usually being fulfilled by the work that we're doing or we are in resistance because of some sort of limiting belief we have. So we've talked a lot about the limiting belief side, but we do have a needs hierarchy. So let's say somebody sits down and they have this huge need for social and emotional connection. I'll even use myself as an example. I love people. I love talking to people. I love psychology and human behavior and emotional connection. If you put me as an accountant where I'm just sitting alone all day crunching numbers, my conscious mind would say, this is a great job. You're an accountant, go to work. And my subconscious mind would be in resistance because I wouldn't be getting my needs met. And so my subconscious mind would probably be sitting there wondering about the people around me, you know, or going on my phone or thinking of what are people up to or what are they feeling? Or I may be analyzing other people in the office. So, you know, our conscious mind can intend one thing, but our subconscious, when we procrastinate, often either has a different set of needs that it's trying to get met, or of course, could have limiting beliefs about the work that we're procrastinating. Like I'm not good enough. I'm incapable. Perfectionism. Perfectionism more often than not is about somebody growing up in a household where in order to stay safe or in order to earn their worth or to earn love and connection, they felt that they had to be perfect. Or if they felt out of control a lot growing up, they try to hyper control everything and show up in the most perfect way that they can because what they're actually doing is trying to avoid the core wounds of feeling out of control or helpless or unworthy or not good enough. And so again, we just cope with this by continuously trying to manage our outside world because what we're actually trying to do is prevent and avoid those inside stored feelings from coming to the surface. Self-medication. Ooh, self-medication. What a good one. Self-medication often happens because we have unresolved trauma. And as a result of all of that, our internal dialogue can be really, really negative because limiting beliefs and painful core wounds produce a lot of negative thoughts. If if I have a belief I'm not good enough, I may think I'm not interesting enough or smart enough or attractive enough, you know, and then my internal dialogue is constantly buzzing all day with these types of thoughts, affecting my emotions, my neurochemistry as a result. And then because we are feeling insecure or sad from our own internal dialogue, often we seek to escape. And so we numb thinking that we're using something again in the outside world, oftentimes it's an attempt, a subconscious strategy to numb our own inside world that's become too painful. The next one is courting temptation. So going to slippery places. Going to slippery places. Do you mind just explaining that more? So Alcoholics Anonymous talk about it a lot, that if you want to avoid alcohol, it's probably a good idea not to go into a pub, for example. One of the ways of allowing the self-sabotage to come forward is to court places where we're going to be Ah, tempted. I see what you're saying. Sort of going into the environments where the temptation could take hold, basically. Yeah, Yeah, the the sort of, I'll just phone a friend for five minutes when you know this friend can't actually have a phone call that's less than half an hour. Yes, (laughs) it's a good example. So in this particular case, you know, often what's happening is our subconscious mind is also a needs meeting machine. It's designed to get its needs met. And if it associates, if we've stored associations like alcohol is pleasureful and helps us escape pain, and then we're having a particularly painful day, our subconscious will do what it can against our conscious mind's will to get closer to the stored associations of, oh, but alcohol makes me feel better. Even though our conscious mind may be able to look at that and say, that's not the case. Alcohol has costed me jail time or my family or DUIs or all these painful things. If our subconscious mind still has that wiring, it will try to edge closer and closer to get its needs met because our subconscious is wired to get its needs met for survival. So reprior, I can't say this one, (laughs) reprior, reprior, reprioritizing. Yes. Well done. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's a tongue twister, that one. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a bit of self-sabotage going on there. I don't want to say this one. Perhaps you can explain it and how it fits in with self-sabotage. Yes. So it depends on what we're reprioritizing more specifically. Would, do you mind giving me an example? Yeah. So once again, we I uh, started off with a discussion about having to do a presentation and you know you've got to do it but you leave it to the last moment and you suddenly decide that it's really important that you 
tidy the apartment, for example. Yes, it's a great example. So in that particular case, it's honestly mirroring back to procrastination principles, which are usually that my conscious mind says, let's go sit down and let's, you know, finish off this project. And my subconscious mind says, no, we have other needs. We'd rather get met instead. And sometimes tidying the apartment meets the need for security or control, especially if that project is making us feel a little bit out of control because we don't like what we're doing or we feel overwhelmed by how big of a a task it is. And so oftentimes we'll reprioritize lower tasks. And it's actually usually our subconscious attempting to get its needs met for control or order or a sense of peace or comfort. So if we spot our subconscious mind beginning to sabotage us, how do we recover and get back on track? Great question. So there's two processes here. The first one is to work through the limiting beliefs. Okay. If I sit down and I finish this task and I sit at my desk for the next four hours, what am I making it mean or what am I afraid will happen? Well, I'm afraid I won't do it well. I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like I'm not going to be good enough, right? So we can try to dig up what that limiting belief is, and then we can work to challenge that. How am I actually good enough to complete this task, right? So we can do, you can leverage a cognitive reframe after digging up that core limiting belief. If it's a big limiting belief in our lives, I recommend we plug it into auto suggestion for the 21 days later on so we don't have to constantly deal with that. The second thing is I often get people to link their needs with their task. So I'll give you an example. I worked with a woman and she said that she really needed to get healthy. She was struggling with her blood sugar. She was pre-diabetic. She really needed to get healthy. And she said, you know, I've been trying to eat healthier, you know, lose weight, exercise more, do these different things, but I keep sabotaging. So we looked at her needs and her biggest needs were comfort, security, family, and social. So her conscious mind was saying, go to the gym, eat healthier, learn all this stuff about cooking keto meals or healthy meals. And her subconscious was saying, no, that's going to take time away from things that we're comfortable with, feel safe with, and it's going to take time away from family and social events. So what we actually got her to do was to link her subconscious needs with her conscious goal. So for example, when it came to exercising, which was part of the goal, we got her to go to group fitness classes with her friends. So suddenly her subconscious need was aligned with her conscious mind's goal. We got her to take cooking classes with her husband and pre-cook healthy meals for the family. We got her to go on more walks with her family and her kids to the park. So now, even though she has this subconscious need for family, she's not in a form of cognitive dissonance between her conscious and subconscious mind. Going to the park and doing these things are actually meeting her needs with family, but also giving her her steps towards her goal. Then we looked at comfort and security and we realized, you know, she was really relying on a lot of food for comfort and security, which is a common thing because if you look at our earliest associations of food, it's when we're being breastfed, which we produce a tremendous amount of oxytocin, the bonding neurochemical during breastfeeding. So what ends up happening is we have a a child, a lot of our stored associations around food are comfort, safety, and connection because we're held, we're cradled, and we have oxytocin production. So she was getting a lot of comfort from food and we realized she was constantly putting herself in situations at work where she was outside of her comfort zone. She had a high demanding job, a lot of discomfort. So we actually had her practice meditation, practice nervous system regulation, like to get more into parasympathetic nervous system mode. So she had a sense of comfort within herself. And we also got her to do things where if she wanted to exercise, she would sometimes do exercise classes from the comfort of her own home where she could, you know, watch something on the TV and and do things at home. So all of a sudden we found ways to get all these needs met for comfort, security, family, and connection that were actually linked to her conscious mind's goal. And that's how we actually create cognitive resonance instead of dissonance in a specific form, which then allows us to move the needle a lot more quickly towards creating the output that we're looking for. So in a moment, we're going to be looking at a letter and seeing if there is any self-sabotage there and how we can help this particular person who's written in. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. If 
you'd like to participate in the program, you can go to my website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, and you'll find a section there called participate in the program. And you can send a letter in to be discussed by myself and my witnesses. I'm finding my work increasingly stressful. I report to two different bosses who don't really communicate properly, so have very little idea of my workload and really only care if their work gets finished. I should be able to cope, but then I find myself saying yes to something extra, worrying about it and not being able to sleep. Sometimes at work I'm so overwhelmed that I find myself staring at the screen and not really getting things done. I take a nap to refocus myself, but it's never enough because my mind is so active at night that I can't sleep properly. I don't want to speak up because I don't want people to think I'm a lightweight and I should be able to cope, at least I used to be able to do so. I take work home and sometimes catch up over the weekend, but that leaves me drained on Monday and I slip behind again. Other times I reward myself with going out with friends. I tell myself that I deserve some kind of social life and one drink becomes many and I can't process anything properly the next day. It's getting so bad my performance is really starting to suffer. So, I think all the alarm bells are ringing here. What are they trying to tell us? <laughs> I feel like there's a whole bunch of things and I love to look at root cause. So, to me, you know, this person has some boundary issues and a lot of self-judgment. And as a result of poor boundaries and self-judgment, they put themselves under too much pressure without speaking up, which then dysregulates the nervous system, right? Puts us too much into fight or flight mode, sympathetic nervous system mode. And then when our nervous system is dysregulated, we're more likely to seek out drinking or avoiding or doing things to try to recreate a sense of security and comfort because we don't feel safe when we're in sympathetic nervous system mode. We're in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn mode. So when we dial it back, I see it as like the nervous system causing us to drink more, causing us to avoid or procrastinate. But underneath the nervous system dysregulation, there's poor boundary issues causing us to be dysregulated. Underneath the poor boundary issues, there's actually a set of limiting beliefs. So this person may feel like if I don't do enough, people are going to think, they said they're going to think I'm a lightweight. So they're going to think I'm not good enough or I'm not capable. I'd be really interested. The word lightweight is a really powerful word. I'm wondering who actually used to use that word and that the correspondent has picked up. Is it your mother, your father, somebody from school days? Whose voice, whose language is lightweight? Yes, absolutely. I really like that. And I think as well, sometimes there's a big core wound that's I am weak. And I really hear that underneath lightweight. You know, is there somebody that made you feel weak growing up? And so my recommendation would be to source what those core wounds are. What do you make the situation mean? Or what are you afraid will happen if you do set boundaries? If you do say, hey, I, I need a break sometimes and you do communicate with your bosses. And if the wounds that come out are things like I am weak or I'm not good enough, I would plug that into auto suggestion. And then I would pair that with practicing a little bit of exposure work on boundaries, setting small boundaries over time until it becomes more comfortable. And then all of a sudden you start to have momentum with these two root issues. And the last thing I would do is I would practice a daily meditation or breath work or something that's going to help you get out of fight or flight constantly and into actually parasympathetic nervous system, that rest and digest mode where you will feel more safe in your body and we're less likely to reach for external substances or alcohol when we feel regulated. So those are my three sort of takes. I'm curious what else you would add. Well, I want to ask you, when this person is sitting there staring at the computer, that seems like a, a moment when there's enough knowledge to know I need to get back on track. I need to do something. What's the thing to do when you're there staring at the computer and yeah. your mind is just a blank? Yes. I see that as a freeze mode. So oftentimes when we're dysregulated, our nervous system is hyper in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. We'll know we're in freeze mode and actually in sympathetic nervous system mode because we'll be frozen and just sitting there or just staring, but our mind's often racing. And so we go into this freeze mode. And generally, if we look back, freeze mode may have been one of many coping mechanisms we had growing up. Maybe when parents were angry or we saw things that scared us, we just froze. And so it seems like a recreation of that. And if we see that, I would absolutely advise that the person takes a step away, 
does a little bit of breath work or meditation or a body scan, something to actually ground you and anchor you back into your body. And then when you feel like, okay, I'm actually reconnected here, it actually turns our conscious mind faculties back up a little bit. Because when we're in freeze mode, a lot of brain activity in the prefrontal cortex shuts down and a lot of brain activity lights up in the amygdala and in the regions more responsible, the limbic system, the regions more responsible for fight or flight. So that can actually help us recenter, get our conscious mind that can then intend, you know, what we can do next back online. So I think that's a great coping mechanism during that experience. But I do want to encourage this person to always go back and try to reprogram the core wounds and and practice boundaries because I do believe those are the root cause factors that are then leading to the dysregulation and freeze mode. Yeah, but it's another topic we must uh, return to on the podcast again, boundaries. I've done it several times, but you can never do too much boundary work. (laughs) Absolutely. So I have to thank you for being a witness today on The Meaningful Life and ask you what makes your life meaningful. The biggest thing that brings meaning to my life is my relationship to God. And that is something that I grew up not believing in too much. And although I've studied many religions, I wouldn't consider myself a particularly religious person. I think there's beautiful, beautiful things in in so many religions, but I very much have a personal relationship to God. and, And that brings me a lot of meaning and that brings me a lot of centeredness and groundedness and has absolutely helped me through challenging times in the past. And, you know, something that really anchors me through anything that I go through and allows me to really take the lessons from challenging moments or challenging times, because I see those as opportunities that God is giving us to evolve and to grow. So I would say that is something that brings me the most meaning in life. Thank you for that. Um, The conversation is going to end here, unless you're a supporter of The Meaningful Life, because um, we're going to look at the four attachment styles, because this is another one of Tice's specialities. We're going to be talking about that in in the bonus material. And if you'd like to hear that, you can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. And if you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life and unlock the bonus material this way, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Collick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.